Holy crap, is a lot happening. Inflation is roaring. The markets are ping-ponging. The president keeps telling stories that the White House then contradicts. And the five and 30-year Treasury bonds inverted in just yesterday, the two-year and the 10-year Treasury bond inverted. I don't know what you guys are thinking, but I will tell you, this is a telltale sign that the recession is coming. Mark my words, get your house in order and make sure you're ready for this. time. I hope you are all ready because Stephen and I have a show for you because you know what? We've been talking about this too long. So many people don't even listen because they're caught up in the FOMO, the fear of missing out on nothing. And they think that they're just going to keep making money. Well, the telltale signs have showed their ugly face. The bond yields have inverted. Now, it's funny, offline, me and Stephen were talking and I was saying, Stephen, do you understand what it means when the five and the 30 year treasury yield inverts? And he says, well, wait a second, the two and the 10 year just inverted yesterday. Now, I missed that. Now, I know this is, sounds like hocus pocus to some of you. You're like, I, Chris, Stephen, I have no idea what the F you're talking about. Like inverted this or that, like I know inverted when I stand on my head and there's a lot of other things you can get into with inverted, but all we're going to tell you right now is that when the bond yields invert, like they just did, shit is going down like the Titanic. Steven, tell us a little bit about what that means when the treasury yields invert. Yeah, good good morning. It's it's good to be back. I think it's been a few weeks since I was here. Doing a lot of traveling out in Utah and California. So nice to be back right in time for some crazy shit going on in the country, like always. So uh, as you're saying, the, the the yield curves are are inverting and, and we can definitely get into that right now. You know, we'll, we'll see where that leads to. But if we look at, for instance, the the 10 and the two year, which Chris, I want you to explain this a little bit to everybody. But when you look at the 10 and two year, just to give you an example, since 1900, the two and the 10 year curves have inverted 28 times. And of those 28 times since the year 200, since the year 1900, 22 out of 28 times, a large recession has followed. So the indicators are starting to point towards a recession coming very, very soon. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's no longer a concern that you have your lazy cash like my cat here who just can't stay off the desk. Now it's a real concern of you better rush to protect what you've made. And, you know, I just got off the phone with somebody the other day, Stephen, and they said, yeah, but my, my, mark, my, my portfolio's down. That's what they said. I said, well, can you describe that? Well, I had X amount. It grew to, well, I'll give you the numbers. I, I had 260 in there. It grew to 290 and I'm back down to 260. He says, well, I don't want to get out now. I want to wait for it to go back up. I said, okay, so let me, let me propose this to you. You're, you have every penny you put into the markets. You don't have the gains that you made, but you have every penny you put in. Are you willing to accept the fact that your 260 could become 200, could be 170, and could be 150? His answer, absolutely not. I said, so where's the problem with getting out without losing any money? His answer blew me away. His answer was, yeah, but I had 290. People get caught up in the things that they think they have that they don't really have. When you make money in the markets, the markets can give you money in terms of returns, interest, dividends, gains, and they can take it away in the matter of a day or two. Folks, a lot of you watch the markets, but you watch the markets in a day, okay? You watch the markets in a week. You look at the ticker and it's up, it's green for the day and you get super excited. Are you really looking at the markets over a six month, a one year? Are you really, really paying attention to what's going on? Because if you just look at like a one month chart, it looks pretty good. That's because we had a big fallout in the market that now has rebounded. But if you look at it over six months, that son of a bitch has gone sideways, maybe even a bit down. And then I always get those people, Stephen, and I know you do, and we're going to get back to this treasury yield. I always get people that say, yeah, but, you know, and it's, we got, I got a joke about yeah, buts. They say, yeah, but 
If I keep my market in the index, I, I love the index word, then over the next 10 or 30 years, I almost can't lose money. And I laugh and I say, you are so smart. You're right. If you put your money in the index and you leave it there for the next 30 years, you probably cannot lose money. The question is, during that 30 years or 20 years or 10 years, whatever your time horizon is, how are you going to feel when your portfolio goes from 100 to 50? Are you going to be okay with that? Are you going to be able to hold through that and be like, I'm not scared. I'm in this for the long haul. Or are you going to sell because you get, you get teary eyed and cry and your, your friends, your family, your wife, your spouse comes and says, honey, we got to get out. We can't lose anymore. That's what will happen because that's what happens to every single person unless you're a professional trader, an institutional trader, or you're just uber wealthy and you don't give a shit about losing half of your investment portfolio because you've got 10 other verticals that all produce cash flow. Stephen, let's get back to this inverted yield curve. Put that chart back up here and I'm going to tell TikTok and Instagram a little bit about what this says. Yeah, here we go. So I'm going to pull, you want me to pull the 10 and the, the two? Yeah, that's the more important one. Like the five and the 30 is important. And just so everybody knows, right? Like the five and the 30 and the two and the 10. Let, let me start with the five and the 30. When the, the yield curve inverts, and I, I can put a chart up here that might kind of give some relevance to this as Stephen's pulling this up. Stephen, can you just explain just a few things real quick while I bring up a chart? Yeah, here we go. My computer's going slow here. Here we go. So folks, I want you to fully understand a little bit more about the significance of what this is. Now, you know, on TikTok and on here, I'll, I'll turn, uh, there we go. I'll turn uh, TikTok. You're going to miss me a little bit, but these are the, these are basically just charts that show treasury bonds. Bonds work very inversely to interest rates and they work with supply and demand. So as more and more people get nervous about the markets. Now, when you talk about treasury bonds, who's the most, who are the big players buying treasury bonds to change things? Other governments, China, Japan, uh, institutions, hedge funds, insurance companies, they are the ones that really move the needle. So if the institutional investors, the hedge funds, the insurance companies and the other countries get nervous that there's maybe a recession coming, what they will do is they will change their, their strategy from a short-term strategy, two-year or five-year, to a long-term strategy, 10-year to 30-year, okay? So when we're looking at these bonds, the, the, the two, the 10, the 30, those are durations, meaning if you bought a two-year treasury bond, in two years, it matures and you get all your money back. A five-year matures in five years, a 10-year matures in 10, a 30-year matures in 30, you, you get the drift. So if you're playing the long game and you think that the markets are going to go down in the short run, because usually a recession or depression is usually a, a couple year thing. Dot com crash was three years. The Great Recession was a couple years. You, you know, the, the pandemic was less than a year. So each one of them has a shorter term horizon, but it's usually very severe. It's usually very consequential if you've got money in the market. So institutions, what they will do is they will do what's called the flight to safety. They will take money from risky assets and move them into safe assets. Treasury bonds, safest asset you can pretty much put your money in because it's guaranteed by the full faith of the United States government. And they've never defaulted on a bond. So just so you understand that. So institutional money that normally would buy a two or a five year bond short term because they're then investing in riskier assets, all of a sudden gets a trigger or a sign or their economists tell them, hey, we need to take a longer term approach because we think the market's going to go down in the next year, two years or whatever it is. Instantly, they will shift their money to a longer term duration bond for the safety of it. And there's there's more to it. They understand the inverse relationship. They also understand that if if the markets fall apart, interest rates by the Fed will get dropped just like they have every other time. So if the Fed drops interest rates, the price of the bonds skyrockets. How many of you want to buy bonds when they're cheap and sell them when they're high, right? Isn't that what Warren Buffett says? Buy low, sell high and don't lose money. Well, isn't that exactly what I just told you how to do? Treasury bonds are going down in price because interest rates are going up. So if you think that there's a recession coming and you're an institution, a hedge fund, an insurance company, you're going to load up on the longest duration treasury bond you can because it's the safest bet and it's going to have the biggest move up when they drop interest rates, which is what these charts show. 
So now when all this money shifts from shorter term focus to and the 10 year bonds into longer term focus, which, you know, if you were in a two year, you move to a 10. If you were in a, a five year, you might or a 10 year, you might move to a 30. If all that money floats there, it changes the yield. And now you can get paid more money. I want you to listen to this, folks. And Stephen, then I'll have you put it up. I'm almost reciting what the article says. It's good. If you put money into a short-term bond, a two-year or a five-year treasury bond, you get paid a higher interest rate. They call it yield, a higher interest rate on that shorter-term bond than you do on the longer-term bond. Does that make any sense? Why would you make more taking a shorter duration versus taking a longer? Almost always, when you go with a 30-year or a 10-year bond, you get paid more for taking a longer duration, a longer time frame than you would taking shorter. But you see that just inverted which means the sentiment in the markets means that it's all going to fall apart because people are willing to accept a lower yield for a longer duration bond. If you don't understand that, I get it. I spent 16 years doing this bullshit on Wall Street. So we had to learn this in the Series 7 stockbroker exam. It was the number one thing we had to learn. It's like singed into my mind. But when I learned it, folks, I didn't understand it. Now, I apply that information, I fully fucking understand it. And this is what the F happens, so that means you better understand this too. Because Stephen, how many times in history has this happened and how many times has it resulted in a recession? Well, with the 10 and the, 10 and the two, it's happened 28 times and we've seen a recession 22 of those 28 times follow. So, so, this, is a, a uh, so this is a chart of the two year and the 10 year, uh, the difference so um, the, the yellow line that you see there is the 10 year minus the two year. So anytime it drops below that, that's when it inverts basically. So you can see it let up right up in the 1980s. Wow. You see it happened back then leading into that. Um, 2001, the dot com, 2008, uh, it happened in 2019. But keep in mind, you know, we followed in 2020 with what we considered a recession, although it was a global pandemic. So a lot of people are saying, this was leading towards and then we printed all the money and now we're just going back to what we what we delayed for a couple of years so folks if like listen like you could be a speculator and you could say this time is going to be different and this time it's not going to lead to a recession like the few other times in history but for me i just like probabilities right and the probability of, given that both of these inverted yield curves have gone you know within days of each other the probability of a recession is far greater than the probability of it not being a recession. You then need to decide what that means to you. Now, let me ask a question for the audience. I don't care if it's YouTube or Facebook or TikTok or Instagram. Honestly, how many of you have ever gone through a recession? Can you say I? Just in the chat, put I for TikTok. In the chat on Instagram, put I if you've gone through a recession. Uh, you can call the pandemic a recession. That's fine. But really, 2008, the dot-com crash, maybe even go back to the 90s, the 80s, the 70s, the 60s, the 50s, the 40s, the 30s. You get the drift. How many of you have lived through a recession? Put I in there. And then YouTube and Facebook, please, in the chat, put I. Crypto Legend has. Andrew has. Uh, we got a bunch of people over here. We got... Buffalo burbs. We, yeah. So lots of people have gone through one. When you went through a recession, can I ask all of you a question? What did that feel like? What was the economic impact to your family, to your business, to your lifestyle? If you didn't plan for that recession, did it hurt? Because I can speak for myself and Stephen can speak for himself Two financial advisors. We both rode the roller, roller coaster straight down 2008. I'll ne that was that was seared into my mind. It was almost like me getting hit by a Mack truck. You'd never forget that. If you got hit by a Mack truck, you would never forget that you got hit by a Mack truck, right? Well, I, I can't forget 2008. It hurt. I, I spun and went into a spiral, a downward spiral. My portfolios all dropped to nothing. I watched my clients lose 30, 40, 50% of their retirement savings. I heard stories of people that were going to retire that no longer could retire. They were working into their 60s, into their 70s, not because they want to, folks, but because they had to, because they didn't plan. Now, see, everybody's saying it sucked. It was, it was terrible. Some people like Devin are saying they were teenagers. Now, if you're a teenager during the Great Recession, you probably didn't really see the impact. Maybe you did. Maybe you remember your parents struggling, but maybe you don't understand the impact. 
I, I know this is what the F happened, but like folks, this just happened. Monday and Tuesday, the yield curves inverted. We have been talking that this event's gonna happen for way longer than this, probably too long, because I'm just not willing to go through that again. And, and all of you that said, I, are you willing to go through what you went through in 2008 again? Are you willing to go through what you went through during the pandemic, but just envision it didn't V, it didn't bounce and go to the moon, it actually continued downward. Are you willing to go through that again? I got nothing gained by telling you this. I'm not selling a product that has anything to do with this. It's not like I have some magic you know, thing that's gonna tell you, hey, buy this course or buy this thing and you won't have to go through the recession. We're all going through this thing. The difference is, for some of you that don't plan, this is going to be one of the worst periods of time in your life. Mark my words. This will be one of the worst financial periods of time in your life. Love it, hate it. I don't really give a shit. For others that actually plan, and many of the ones that have been around the campfire on What the F Happened, on our wealth webinars, on our three-day events that we do, you are ready. You have planned. You have exited the market at the highest point ever. You have taken your profits off. You maybe put that money into treasury bonds or privatized banking policies. You are ready. This event, although it will suck, will be the greatest opportunity of your lifetime. So do you want this to be one of the hardest times in your life or one of the greatest opportunities in your life? That's your decision. I can't tell you which side of the fence to be on. I know where I'm at. This is going to be the greatest bloody opportunity of my lifetime. But that's a sad state of affairs right there all in itself. Because as you all know, in order to make money in the market, somebody else has to lose. So for this opportunity to happen for any of us, for myself, Stephen, my cat, Cashy, because he's going to be able to eat better food, any of you, the opportunity comes at the expense of somebody else losing. And that losing comes in many forms. Sometimes they lose their home, they lose their job, they lose their retirement accounts, they lose their brokerage account. I mean, it's a sad thing, but that's just the way the markets work. Stephen, what else do we got? Because now I just beat everybody up because there is, there is a shiny silver lining to this whole thing. And we really got to get through that because, yes, it's scary to understand that this is coming. But it's also important that you understand how to tackle this, like treasury bonds. Treasury bonds are a great place short term to park your money, because if you understand that when the markets drop, interest rates will also be pulled by the Fed, that will skyrocket your treasury bonds. But once that happens, you've got to get out. Warren Buffett always says it best, man. And he says, buy low, which is right now, if you're buying treasury bonds, you're buying pretty low, sell high. So if treasury bonds spiked, you'd have to sell them. And if you do one and two, you, you have number three happen automatically. And that is you will not lose money. Right now, if you're in the stock market and you haven't sold your winners, like, are you willing to, well, just like my family member that I talked about, are you willing to lose all of what you've made? I, that's up to you. I don't know. <laughs> Crypto legend. Whole life, period. <laughs> Love it. All right. What and, else? We and, Chris, and Chris, just to kind of bring it into the real world, you know, I mean, a lot of this is being caused. The Fed is trying to fight off inflation, right? And they're doing that by raising oh. rates. And anytime they raise rates like that, it causes the short-term treasuries to rise quickly as well. And that's what's kind of causing a lot of these flattening and inverse relationships. And so, you know, while they're doing this to kind of use it as a weapon against inflation, overall, what it does is it slows that economic growth, like you were saying, and that's what it affects all the markets and everything like that, because it increases the cost of borrowing from everything. And that's why we see mortgage rates going up right now. I mean, we're seeing mortgage rates starting to hit 5%. We haven't seen that in, in years, right? So the mortgage rates, so everything in your life, not only in your retirement accounts and the markets and things like that, you might be saying to yourself right now, well, I don't even have any money in the markets right now. This doesn't affect me. Well, it does because the cost of everything goes up and that includes businesses. So banks aren't able to lend as much money. Banks aren't able to move as much money. So businesses aren't able to borrow as much money and grow and put more out there. So it truly does affect everything. I mean, if you do have any credit card debt, first off, get a get a, a money multiplier policy open. Let's get that debt taken care of because rates are just going to go up and up and up and credit card rates are going to follow that. So, so your interest is going to get higher and higher. So when the yield curve steepens, banks are, you know, they're able to borrow money at lower rates and then lend at higher rates. So conversely, when these things flatten, you know, they're, they're, all those margins are squeezed, so they have to charge more. So it's just kind of, uh, it affects literally everything that, that, that's going on right now. And it is important to keep paying attention to this stuff. What else we got, Stephen? All right. So um, so according to MSNBC, 
The Biden approval ratings fall despite the booming economy is the headline. So the I'm, booming I'm just economy. wondering if I'm just wondering if maybe that was a typo and instead of booming, they meant a bombing economy because I don't know what they're looking at, but um the American people and uh, you and me seem to not really agree with this headline here. What do you think? <laughs> oh my god, I don't know. I think that's a typo. Like uh yeah, his his ratings. I I don't I don't have any comment on whether his ratings are falling. I don't know or care. But despite the booming economy, because when <laughs> I look around, folks, does anyone see a booming economy? I mean, it, I guess if you look at the stock market, because they just printed five trillion dollars, it's hard not to have a good stock market when there was that much money pumped into the capital markets. But I don't know. I mean, that could be very well a typo. Who who posted that one? Uh, it's MSNBC. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious <laughs> go figure so it's just it just it just goes to show you though there's so much stuff out there that fill our our heads with information from both sides i mean somebody will tell you the world's going to end tomorrow and then another news site's telling you that everything's booming and everything's great and it's the highest rising economy since 1987 and and all this stuff according to msnbc and so we have that going on we have war like you like you started out inflation is still roaring right now the fed is raising rates interest rates are rising all over the place and then we have a leader leading the united states of america that 81 people 81 million americans voted for for, apparently. And this guy's out there this past week, just, just fucking things up. I mean, we're the Russian Ukraine war is a big deal. Like there's a lot of things that could happen because of this nuclear war could be caused by this and just three things that happened this week. And I just, it just, and I have a point just talking about this. So just three things real fast. The white house has been forced to walk back or clarify multiple remarks while Biden was overseas in Europe on a trip, including having to clarify on Saturday that the president was not calling for regime change in Moscow. Biden's remarks that president uh, Vladimir Putin cannot remain in power reverberated throughout Washington on Sunday with some current and former officials and lawmakers scrutinizing the reported ad lib while others slammed the White House for its subsequent walk back. Biden turned heels on Saturday when at the end of the speech in Warsaw, Pol Poland, he said, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Number two, and you're going to see when you're there, he told the 82nd Airborne Division, talking to a bunch of American troops, uh, talking when you're in Ukraine, basically telling our troops that they're going to be on the ground in Ukraine. Immediately, the White House had to release a bunch of statements, walking that back. That's not what he meant. We're not sending troops to Ukraine. This stuff has impacts, though. And then number three, finally, on Thursday, Biden was asked if the U.S. would resp respond if Russia were to use chemical weapons a part of the invasion in Ukraine. Biden said that such a move by the Russians would trigger a response in kind. Immediately, within minutes, the White House released, no, 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 no. We will have to evaluate the situation if things like that happen. We are not going to immediately reply with other chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, or anything of the such. So three things within a week overseas while we have a war. And this stuff makes a difference because the, the, the currency in this country... The dollar is is the, the dollar has such value because of the worldwide power that it has. It's the world's reserve currency. And when we have leaders out there that just don't make sense, that they're scaring foreign leaders, and we have stories on here, I'll pull up in a second, where places like China and India are now starting to look at things like Russia to get all of their oil from. And there's talks in China right now of of instead of having the petrodollar with Saudi Arabia, they're talking about maybe starting to use the yen to start purchasing more and more oil and make that the world reserve currency when it comes to petro. So there's so much going on right now. We have this guy that's out there just talking crap, but the markets, if we look at the market over the last 30 days, the stock market, things just keep going up and up and up. We're telling that the economy is all going to be fine. And I just feel like it's one big trap. Because when you step back and you look at it from that point of view, it's like, yeah, everything's great. Everything's good. The market's up. Let's keep our money in our 401ks. Let's keep chugging along. It's going to be fine. Until when? Until it's not. And that's just why, like, man, like, you got to understand what's really happening. And you can't, you can't start reacting and be prepared once it already happens. It's going to be too late. Like, if you ever say you can't time the markets, Chris, you say that all the time, right? Buy low, sell high, and don't lose money. It sounds so simple. Why can't more people do that? because they don't realize it until it's too late. So yeah. that's why this show, what we do is so important because you guys have to understand what's really going on out there. And I don't mean to get a political, I don't care who the president is. If they're out there making these kinds of mistakes in this kind of tense situation that we're in the world right now, it's just stuff that we need to be really, really uh, aware of. 
Yeah. So folks, just for, you know, this is what the F happened. If you're just joining us, I know on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, you know, people are coming in and out. This is where we rant, rave, and argue as we did with uh, my buddy, Larry here, who needs a hug. This is all about the markets in review. And we're really just talking about the markets in the week that just passed. There's a couple more topics we're going to hit. Just so I want to kind of forward pace a little bit where we're going. Number one, we're going to talk about real estate. That's going to be the next place we're going to go. I also want to talk a little bit about one of these questions that came in from Variable Money on TikTok. Uh, they said, do you think we're looking at a soft landing or a hard landing within the next 12 months. I certainly want to hit that. Stephen brought something up. I don't know if we'll have time to get at it, but about the US dollar, about digital currency, uh, which would be what China's you know, testing out over in China in certain cities, but also about what the impact would be right now with the end of globalization. As Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock said, we might be seeing the end of globalization because of sanctions the U.S. is putting on Russia, which is curbing trade, which is making everybody sit there and think, should oil be traded in U.S. dollars? Should oil be valued in U.S. dollars or should it just be everybody can trade oil in whatever their dollar is, the yen, the, the ruble, whatever it is? These are important facts and important things we need to talk about. But, Stephen, if we if we may, let's. Let's talk real estate. We love real estate. Now, I want to ask everybody, anybody here on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, if you think real estate is the greatest investment on earth, put in the chat I. And, and I'm going to put I in there because I think real estate is single-handedly the greatest investment on earth. So I want to see how many of you think real estate is the greatest investment on earth. I want to just gauge this. we got a whole bunch of people coming in saying that, uh, yes, real estate's the greatest investment on earth. So I, I fully believe that, 100%. It's a tangible asset. It has multiple exit strategies, meaning if we buy real estate, there's many different ways we can exit it or stabilize it. We can rent it. We can do Airbnbs. We can we can flip it. We can. There's so many. You can refinance it. So all these exits. But all of you that put I, would you also agree there's a right way to invest in real estate and a wrong way? So let's just talk real estate because a lot of people right now are looking in the rearview mirror, as always. Me and Stephen talk about this all the time. So I want everybody to just kind of close your eyes real quick. And I want you to envision something. It's early in the morning. You just had your coffee. You get in your car. You back out of your garage and you're getting ready to drive to work. But instead of looking out the big front windshield, you're going to test this. You're going to only look in the rear view mirror. You're not going to look out the front windshield at all. You put your car in drive, staring in the rear view mirror, looking out the back windshield, and you start to drive. How long does it take before you run into something? Did you take out your mailbox? Did you hit your neighbor's mailbox? How long? Did any of you watch The Wolf of Wall Street when he was driving that Lamborghini home completely shit-faced? How many things did he hit? Everything. He was clearly driving his car in the rear view mirror, just like many of you are. It is so easy to look into the past and, and see what real estate has done, which has been very good. Real estate has gone up and up and up and up. Rents have gone up and up and up, especially since the pandemic. But let's now stop looking in the rearview mirror. Don't look at your car because it's completely destroyed and you're going to have to replace some mailboxes and probably your neighbor's front door because you just drove your car straight through it. Moving forward, we know some factual things are going to happen. So here's to Larry. He says, you know, why don't you get to the facts? Here's the facts. We know that the Fed is going to raise interest rates in 2022 another six times. They just announced that. They raised them once already, and they're going to do it another six times. Is it going to be a quarter percent, a half, a half a percent? We don't know. They're trying to, quote, unquote, curb inflation, which is not what they're doing. They're just trying to get interest rates higher so they can drop the lever. But we won't go there. We know they're going to raise interest rates. We already know that that one interest rate raise that they just did increased mortgage rates from, I mean, how many of you have bought or refinanced the house under 3%? I bet you a lot of you, right? Or even 3 to 4%. Right here, mortgage interest rates today, March 28th, rates rise again. You see, the markets are always trying to get ahead of what's actually going to happen. Stephen just pulled it up on the screen. So here we go. We got some huge lenders, 425. That's actually a 15 year, 4.58 on a 30 year. So, and then rates last week, 4.56. That, that's right off online. You guys can Google this. You don't need to use my advice. Rates are four and a half percent. 
A year ago, you could have gotten that same 30-year mortgage for under 3%. Not even a year ago, you could have gotten it in the low threes. Rates have gone up that much, and the rate in the Fed only raised interest rates a quarter percent. So 52-week yeah, 50, low, 3%. So now we're up at 4.58. So we're up a point and over a point and a half. Yeah, they only year. raised interest rates a quarter percent, but your mortgage rates just went from what was the average? Three per, just a bit over three. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 52 week low and you know was third three percent and now we're 4.58 that's a 1.58 percent increase but they only raised rates a quarter percent it's because they're speculating into the future they're trying to get ahead in forward pace so now we're going to raise rates another six times this year even if they only do it four times right there's some of you that would say oh they're not going to do it six times they already said they're going to but oh maybe they're not what is that going to mean for the cost of buying a house at these crazy high real estate prices. The average house price in this country right now is, I, Stephen, where is it? Is it in the mid 300s, I believe? Yeah, I think so. And this is a chart just 2001 of what the real estate market's done. And just look at that spike. Oh my gosh. I mean, here, folks, for those of you who can't see what he's drawing, let me show you what the price of real estate has done just in the last year. Wow, that's a terrible line. Let me get a thicker pen here. This is what real estate prices has, have done. Literally, like I'm looking at the chart right here. That's what it looks like. So this is real estate prices. And everybody is super excited of this because everybody's house is worth more money. So they feel rich. The same exact thing happened in 2006 and 2007 by this chart I'm looking at. But now when the average house price in this country is mid 300s and interest rates already went up 1.5% and are going to go up higher, is it likely that by the end of 2022 to get a 30 year mortgage, it could be five and a half percent? It's very probable that that will be the case, maybe even higher. So if we go from three percent where everybody could afford the three hundred and fifty thousand dollar house at minimum. And most of you are probably buying houses in the six to eight hundred thousand range because that's about what most of them are selling for. Can the average person afford the six to eight hundred thousand dollar house? if rates are 5% plus? The answer is probably not. They could afford it when they were 3%, but can they afford it if that price almost doubles? No. So what does that mean? You guys all might say, yeah, but real estate, there's so much demand. There's only demand because fucking money is abundant. And because it's true. When the price of money goes up, which it is already, that demand will start to wean out. It will start to slow down. Like, listen, folks. This is just- and the other thing you hear, Chris, the other thing you hear a lot is, well, people are buying cash. It's a lot of cash buyers out there. So tell me, why is it all, ca- you know, even let's say mortgage rates don't matter because it's all, a lot of cash buyers are still driving the demand. Do you know why they're cash buyers? It's because they have nowhere else to put their money right now. Yeah. Interest rates are so low. They're out there buying real estate because they have nowhere else to put it. And they know that they can stick it there. They don't trust the stock market. They're not dumping it, everything into there. So they're buying real estate. But guess what? As interest rates rise, as they're able to put their money in safe places at decent rates to actually make money that outpaces inflation, as inflation starts to come down, those cash real estate purchases aren't going to be there. And as mortgage rates rise, it slows the housing market. It's going to drop prices. Like it's all connected. So just because it's cash buyers, the only reason is because of those low rates that we've had for several past years. Yeah. So, so in conclusion of that, we know rates are going up, which means the cost of buying a home and getting a mortgage is going to go up. Why is there so much cash in the system? Stephen just said, because people are taking their money out of the markets, putting it into real estate because it's a much more secure. And listen, I agree with that. Way more secure place to put your money than the stock market right now. And not only that, why are there so many cash buyers? Does anyone know what I buyers are? Does anyone know what hedge funds are? Do you realize that most of the buyers buying from, from wholesalers and most of the buyers out there buying, whether you know it or not, are hedge funds? That is hedge fund money, folks. Trillions of dollars, federal funds supporting these hedge funds like BlackRock and Blackstone. It's all spoken mirrors, folks. But why would hedge funds be dumping money into the markets at these prices? Because it's safer to buy real estate than it is to buy risky investments like the index or stocks. Folks, if you don't if you don't follow what the hedge funds are doing, you're a damn fool. But the, the one thing you have to understand, if you're going to be buying real estate, because somebody just said it's the most secure. So this person said, not my buyers. They didn't say all buyers are. I, I love it. Everybody's, I say something, everybody's like, not all buyers are, are hedge funds. Of course they're not, but a lot of them <laughs> are, depending on different parts of the country. So if you buy real estate now, here's the only thing you need to know. 
Real estate is the number is the best investment on earth, but there is a right way and a wrong way to invest in real estate. If you're buying real estate now and your plan is to exit that real estate in the next five years, I will make a prediction, a very high probability prediction that you will not be able to get what you paid for that price, that house in three to five years from today. Mark my words, everything we're seeing, looking out the front windshield, not the rear view mirror, okay, for all you naysayer haters, if you're looking out the front windshield, the telltale signs are there. Housing is going to go down in price in the next three to five years. It has happened every other period of time in history. Why wouldn't it happen this time? This might be the exception. Hey, if it is, come over here to Buffalo, New York and slap the shit out of me for giving you bad advice because I don't, I don't really care. It's not going to change. Here we go. Priced out of paradise. Florida home buyers feel they must feel they're getting squeezed by investment firms and hedge funds. 40%, Chris, 40% of home sales in Palm Beach County in 2021 worth cash from these people. 40% so of home sales. Maybe it's not all, but 40% is a pretty freaking hefty number. And I, I, it's Palm Beach County. That's where I am. It's just the first thing I pulled up, but I'm sure it's very similar in many other places across the country, if not more. Yeah. Here's the thing. If your house price goes down in value, do your property taxes go down in value? No. Your property taxes probably stay right where they were at because counties around the country are going out and reappraising or reassessing your homes to get that new locked in super high price so that they get a raise. They're smart motherfuckers. And that's what they're doing. They're getting a raise by simply just using today's appreciated housing pricing to reappraise your house so you pay higher taxes. I know mine just got reappraised. It sucks, but hey, that's the world we live in. It doesn't matter. So if you're investing in real estate, a couple of words of advice, try to buy as much rental real estate as you can while rates are still low. Bulk up on them. Try to buy B and C apartment buildings. Don't buy those A's, those expensive lofts, because when this whole shit goes down, people aren't gonna be able to afford two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 a month rents. People are going to be looking for that $800 to $1,500 rental or home, and that's what you need. So buy them up, but have a long-term horizon. If you are buying real estate for the short-term gains, if you're a flipper, if you're buying short-term rentals because you think the price is going to go up in the future, you will be stung by the hornet, and the hornet will be the markets. will take that from you. So just have a long-term time horizon. Some people ask, how long? I don't, you want to play it safe? 10 years. You better hope you're going to hold that real estate for 10 years. Now, I hope I'm wrong with that. But if you look at economic cycles, there's a three year period of decline. OK, they call it deleveraging. That'll be three years, recession, depression, whatever it is. And then there's usually going to be a six to seven year period of recovery. Same with 08, same with the dot com crash. So 10 years is about what your time horizon has to be. If you got 10 years and you're just going to cash flow it, game on. Take advantage of these low interest rates. And folks, 5% is going to look super cheap in the next couple of years. So don't think that 5% is expensive. Stop looking in the rear view mirror. Look out the front windshield. What was the other topic I said I wanted to hit? Do you want to hit uh, crypto? Let me, let me hit crypto for two seconds. Yeah, we got some crypto. All right, because we're running out of time quick, folks. But we got a lot of... Who in here invests in crypto? And I'll keep my hand up. I do. Oh, look at... Holy crap. Instagram just lit up like freaking... Well, I wasn't, I'm not going to say it, but yeah... A lot of you invest in crypto, okay? Now, I invest in Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. Those are the only two that I buy. I do own some Cardano and, and some Polkadot, but very, very small positions. But I have large positions in Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I work with, I think, Stephen, some of the best crypto minds out there. Spencer Montgomery, you guys can all look him up. He is who I get my advice from. I'm not the crypto expert, don't want to be. All of you TikTokers on here that are crypto people and Instagram are TikTok or Instagram uh, crypto people, you're way smarter than me. I'm an ex Wall Street guy. I go off of support and resistance levels and people smarter than me. I've gotten smart enough to know that I'm not smart enough. So Spencer called me up when we were speaking at Secret Knot and he told me some things that he has been analyzing and things he said. He says, I think we're going to see a major drop in crypto, but not until crypto does this next run. And I said to him, I said, okay, so how long do you think this run's gonna be? He said, I don't know. It's really difficult to tell, but I think we could see 60 to $90 or $90,000 a share on Bitcoin, or I said share, but a coin. He said, you could see 60 to 90,000, but 90 is incredibly speculative. He said, 60 is probably likely, but then he said, after that, it's gonna crash with the markets. He 
Spencer Montgomery, who only invests in crypto, is saying that the entire markets are going to go. And when the markets go, crypto will go with it because if they're correlated. Everybody wants to think that they're non-correlated. They, look at how they trend. The market goes up, Bitcoin goes up. The market goes down, Bitcoin goes down. Almost all, all always correlated. So here's my thing. I've been buying crypto now for a couple of years, probably, but very heavily in the last year. And I've been buying ranges. For a while, I traded 40 to 50. I'd buy it around 40 to 42. I'd sell it around 50 to 55. Okay. And I did this for a while and I made a bunch of money. Then it ran to 65. So I held it and I ran or 68. I held it to about 62 and I dumped my position. When it fell back down to 28, I started buying at 34,000. I bought all the way down to 28. It ran back up. I sold it at 44. It then pulled back again. And I had this conversation with Spencer and I bought a very large position of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I am looking for my exit to be 50,000. We're at $47,028 and 70 cents as of, I think right now, you can see we're trending now at about this 47, 48 level, we hit some resistance, which is why we haven't bounced through that. We've been trying, but we can't, if we get to 50, I'm out. And I'm taking my gains and I'm laughing all the way to the bank. And most of you maybe should look at doing that too. Because those of you that strive to want to hit that $90,000, your chance of success is significantly de decreased. So folks, when it comes to crypto, I mean, depending on what your goal is, listen, I will tell you this. If there's any Bitcoin or any crypto investors that are playing the long game five years, you're going to win that game. I'm just being honest. I truly, truly believe Bitcoin and Ethereum, and those are the only two I'm going to speak on, are going to be great long-term plays, especially if the United States comes up with a digital currency and tries to get everybody to turn in their Bitcoin for this new digital currency that's going to replace the dollar. And that probably will happen sooner than later, because that will at first drop Bitcoin because of fear, but then it will make Bitcoin so unbelievably valuable. If you want a metric to go off of, look at gold. The U.S. banned gold and look what happened to gold. It's gone up and up and up. I don't think gold's a great investment right now. I think if you are playing the doomsday thing and you're thinking that you're going to need to have something to trade, then yeah, start getting your gold and silver. But I, I'm not buying, I'm buying some actual like silver coins, but I'm not bulking up on gold at this present point. I still think it's a great long-term investment. I'm just looking for a little bit lower price to buy it at. But Bitcoin, if you're playing the long game, you're good to go. But if you are worried that you, you know, if, if it goes from where it's at 47 now down to 28 or 20, are you going to be OK holding through that? If you're not, then look for your exit soon. Listen, like I'm not telling you how to invest, but these are these are just the metrics in which I was trained for 16 years on Wall Street to follow. And then I'm getting advice from Spencer Montgomery, who's far smarter than me and most of you as well on this topic. So that that's all I have to say about that. So. And then the other thing I want to talk about, Stephen, <laughs> this is this is funny. But how, hey, how about, the, how about the old NFT? Oh, NFT, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a board ape NFT was just sold for only one hundred and fifteen dollars. Wait, am I reading that right? <laughs> yeah, I read the article though. So, Sony had sent this one over. I read the article, and it's uh, they're saying it could have been a mistake or a hack. But it just goes to show you, if you don't know what you're doing with crypto, you don't know what you're doing with these NFTs and all this new technology, like you can lose money very, very quickly with one little mistake of a click. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them. But I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Click that alert button. Actually, smash that alert button and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.